Okay, let's get started. So hello everyone, welcome back to another interview. I'd like to introduce you all today to Dr. Rodolfo Durzo, being professor at Stanford University and a very prominent researcher on ecological conservation. Uh, Dr. Durzo, could you please introduce yourself a little more? Yes, absolutely. Uh, hello everybody. My name is Rodolfo Durzo, as you have just heard, and I am a professor in the biology department of Stanford University, but also in the Earth Systems Department. So I have appointments in the two, in these two departments, which have to do really with, with ecology, conservation of nature, and all of the things related to, to those two major topics of, of, uh, of the biological disciplines and Earth Systems disciplines that we study in this university. I am also very interested in, in education at all levels. Um, going from uh, education in classes at the university, Stanford and other universities around the world, but also education and, and sharing the scientific knowledge with the public in general, like we're doing just now. It's wonderful. So I'm just curious, is there any topic that you are currently researching and would it be possible for you to share it with us? Yes. Um, um, the topic that I am uh, currently uh, uh, investigating, and when I say I, I really mean uh, me personally, but also the, the group of students and colleagues that I have uh, in Stanford and around the world. Uh, I am particularly interested in understanding how anthropogenic impact is affecting biodiversity, but not only in the sense of, you know, how many species are threatened by extinction or how many populations are being impacted and are declining, but also, and beyond that, to what extent those impacts of humanity, of the human enterprise today, are affecting the ecological processes in which the species of plants, animals, and microorganisms are involved. To give an example, you know, we all understand that pollination, the interaction between plants and the little animals, or sometimes the big animals that pollinate them, for the plants to reproduce, that process called pollination, in the past used to be uh, used to uh, occur in areas which were extensive with uh, a good abundance of animals and plants, and very sophisticated inter in, um, interactions occurred under normal conditions. But now, given anthropogenic impact, for example, instead of us having extensive areas of, say, rainforest or savanna or grassland, those interactions have to occur in small fragments of vegetation. Or those interactions have to occur now in the context of increases in temperature given climate change. Or those interactions are having to occur now in the context of the environment being polluted because of chemical pollution or sometimes invasive non-native species that do not, species that do not belong to the ecosystem where where, where they are moved into. So to understand how these wonderful, fascinating ecological relationships between organisms, say between plants and animals, as in the case of pollinators, are going to be playing out given the anthropogenic impacts that, that uh, the planet is experiencing today. And I mentioned the case of pollination, but in, I am investigating multiple aspects of ecological interactions and the disturbance of those uh, via or due to the activities of, uh, of humanity today. Wow, yes. I think I did study something similar in biology class last year. And mm. this is, I guess, a wider question, but what brought you to this kind of research today, you know, conservation biology? I read that you were actually a plant biologist um, starting off when you went yes. to university. So what brought you here today? Yes, um, uh, the, the, the path uh, that brought me to this situation today is uh, um, initially I was a very dedicated um, evolutionary biologist. I wanted to understand the details of the evolution between uh, organisms as they interact in their environment. But um, very soon when I was doing my research in Southeast Mexico in a tropical rainforest area, I began to notice that um, deforestation and um, trafficking of animals and illegal hunting and so on were occurring outside in the perimeter of the area where I was doing my research in this beautiful rainforest ecosystem. And then I began to realize if I don't do something about the conservation uh, of these places, very soon I will not be able to do 
the studies that I'm interested in doing, like the ecology and evolution of these interactions, because I could see that around my uh, study site, which was a biological preserve, around that deforestation was rampant and uh, activities of pollution and contamination and uh, and uh, uh, exploitation and over-exploitation of wildlife was occurring. And I said, if this continues, then basically in the future, people will not have places to go to or scientists will, will not have uh, ecosystems from which to learn all of these ecological processes, those fascinating ecological processes, we might not be able to continue understanding there because we are preventing those processes of occur of occurring or modifying them in such a way that they might be being modified or might be declining. So that preoccupation actually moved me from, you know, very um, question-driven um, research agenda to, uh, um, to a, a problem-driven research agenda. And that, that was sort of my transition from analyzing the processes and now analyzing the processes in the context of uh, global environmental change. So that's essentially yes. the current and sort of the reasoning and the the natural path that, that led me to the, the situation and the process and the research that I'm doing today. Right. Um, and I know it's very hard for people to put conservation efforts in action due to the many obstacles. But in your opinion, how do you think we can best combat all these little issues or not little issues, all these issues that come from having environmental challenges? Uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, there are uh, several steps to 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 get to the point that you are asking about. Um, I think one of them is um, to use um, science-based information to become aware of the nature and critically the magnitude of the problems that we're facing today. Second, second phase is to disseminate that information, and the typical way as you know, and, and the people who are going to be listening to our conversation, the typical way in which we scientists do disseminate these things is th uh, via or through publications, right? Scientific uh, publications in academic journals, science, nature, proceedings of academies and the Journal of Ecology and so on and so forth. And that is okay. That is a way of communicating and sharing with the scientific community the results of our uh, research and you know, of our findings in terms uh, of, uh, in this case, conservation problems. But then that is, um, to me, that is a, a restricted dissemination because not everybody will be uh, uh, motivated or, or will have the necessity to read these academic journals, right? Policymakers and critically, the general public will not be reading these academic journals. So the next thing that, the next phase in addressing and moving uh, from knowledge to action is to make sure that the information first is science-based from the point of view of the scientists like me. In other words, is is you know factual information, the best information based on, on the scientific process is disseminated be beyond the academic uh, sphere, reaching out to the policymakers and also to the general public, uh, broadly speaking. And then, interact with uh, the decision makers in the implementation of the solutions. And um, to make it clear for the people who are listening to us, the basic thing that uh, scientists like, like me, what we do is to design the research, get the results, and, and we, we tend to be very good at it, right? Uh, but the more critical aspects are second in complexity are the dissemination beyond the scientific community, and third, the interaction with the policymakers or the people who have the responsibility of implementing and apply the knowledge that we generated into the practical solutions. And that tends to be much more difficult for us scientists because you know we don't work um, in governments, uh, although in, in some cases some scientists do, but in, in the vast majority of scientists do not work in governmental offices or do not have the capacity to reach out to the you know the top decision maker for them to implement the things that that um, that need to be implemented, but I think as we move from generating the knowledge to the dissemination of the knowledge, reaching out to the communities that need to have this knowledge, that need to be aware of these 
challenges and then working together for the implementation. Uh, and then in the last point, there's another complication, which is the following. Uh, we tend, we have been tending to work up to very recently in silos, you know, different disciplines in separation from other disciplines. I think now for the implementation of action, for moving from knowledge to action, we need to work in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary frameworks. So for example, if I may take the time to use an example, which will illustrate my, my point here. I am doing some research in Kenya, in Africa. And this research has to do with a problem of biological diversity loss, which is the fact that we humans, some aspects of or some elements of our societies are dedicated, for example, to the overexploitation of wildlife. Elephants for the, Afri for the ivory trade, or uh, giraffes for the pelts, or meat from buffaloes, and things like that. So we're having an impact on biodiversity via these kinds of activities, right? We're also affecting wildlife in the transformation of their natural habitats into something else. Say, for example, a monoculture of um, uh, African palm plantations. So those kinds of activities are decimating the wildlife, right? And so our research in Africa has shown via experimental manipulations that if we lose the wildlife from habitats such as the African savannas, one thing that happens is that other animals that in the absence of the big animals, um, in the absence of those animals, those other groups of animals become much more abundant, in particularly, particularly small body sized animals. So imagine, um, let's imagine that a savanna loses the big animals, the elephants, giraffes, zebras, buffaloes, nyandus, and so on, then the grasses are going to grow much more, the shrubs are going to grow much more, the soil is going to be less compacted, and then we are creating the conditions for the small animals that we don't hunt, that we don't overexploit, to become more abundant, particularly small animals such as rodents, uh, rats, chipmunks, and so on. So our research is showing that in the absence of the big animals, these other little animals tend to increase in abundance. And then we collaborate with the Centers for Disease uh, Control in the US for them to investigate if these little animals are increasing, do they carry any, any diseases? And now we're doing molecular analysis in collaboration with the CDCs to see these animals that are increasing in abundance, to what extent do they represent a risk for society if they carry some pathogens, some diseases. And that's the part that we're doing with the CDCs. And they are identifying all of the diseases that these animals carry in their own ecology, in their own evolution, but now becoming much more abundant, becoming a problem for, for human health, right? Just to, to uh, give you uh, an example, some of the diseases that have been discovered that we, uh, that this collaboration has discovered includes things such as Bartonella, Leptospira, Leishmaniasis, even some animals are presenting uh, Black Death, that bacterium that caused the, uh, the, those horrible pandemics in, in those medieval times, are also uh, present in those animals. And now we are increasing those animals in their abundance. So you see, now it becomes a problem that has to do with human health, starting with a problem in ecology. But my interaction with uh, people in, in the CDC uh, and the interaction with molecular biologists is crucial. But beyond that information that now we have about the ecological consequences of this loss in biodiversity, the wildlife, the consequences in terms of risks of human for human health, now we need to go beyond that and implement all of that knowledge for communities in Africa, and even for tourists that might go to a, to an, to a safari in Africa, and might come into contact with those animals and create a next pandemic, for example. Well, that element, the last element of uh, passing all of this information and making sure that we uh, address the problem or the risk that we have in front of us, that needs not only biologists, not only ecologists, not only molecular biologists who will do the DNA analysis, but also we need social workers. We will need people in the, in the schools of medicine, epidemiologists and so on to work collectively, right? And also people who will be able to communicate to the local communities and to the um, health offices in those countries, in these regions of the world, 
all of these problems that we have detected. You, so you see a critical issue now is to move away from being uh, working in silos in independent units to work now multidisciplinarily in multiple disciplines and interdisciplines. And if I may, just to close this, um, I am very uh, happy and excited to uh, communicate to you, to share with you that Stanford University has created a new school of sustainability in which our mission is to go from, uh, to, to actually close the gap from knowledge to action via interdisciplinary work. 